All right, so in this episode of Medieval Warfare, we're going to keep talking about Christianity and its impact on the late Roman Empire. But in this video, I want to talk specifically about the rise of this concept in early Christianity of Christian monasticism and the general start of monks. Because when we get to the medieval period, monks are going to have a lot to do with medieval warfare, both in terms of practice and in terms of intellectual justification. So, before I get started, if you guys want a really good deep dive on this subject, then you need to read Peter Brown's The Rise of Western Christendom. This is one of the key books on the subject. Uh, with that out of the way, let's get started. So, the crisis of the 3rd century comes to an end in 284 CE, when the Emperor Diocletian comes to power. Diocletian is uh, very much a pagan in the way that we understand the term. He does not care very much for Christianity, and he initiates what's typically called the Great Persecution of Christians between 303 and 313. So, when he's doing this, what he's using in his propaganda, in his edicts, in his laws, etc., that are basically used to set this whole thing in motion, is a militant language to justify the persecution of Rome's Christian population. What this does is it sets off this intellectual battle between Christians and pagans, and then eventually Christians and uh, Muslims over, well, who's, who's correct, whose faith is right. In order to do this, Christianity takes up that militant language initially used by Diocletian, and Christian religion and philosophy begins to direct that towards paganism. Now, in order to do this, Christianity needs heroes and soldiers. It needs people that it can hold up as the right kind of guy to help justify Christianity and why it's superior. So the heroes in this line of thinking are martyrs and saints, and the soldiers are monks and warrior saints. So who are these guys and how does this develop? And why is it important for the development of medieval warfare? So, the first big deal saint and monk that Christianity kind of develops is this guy, Saint Anthony the Great, who lives between 251 and 356. So, just over 100 years old. Anthony is a Christian living in, you know, Roman Egypt, um, and we have a pretty decent record of his life coming from his hagiography, which is the uh, genre of source material that we get not only in late antiquity, but the medieval period, which basically records the lives of different saints. So we know from the life of St. Anthony, written by Athanasius, that Anthony is a Christian living in Egypt, and around the age of 20, he walks into a church, and part of the sermon being given by the priest is coming from Matthew, specifically chapter 19, verse 21, in which the line is, if you want to be perfect, go, sell what you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. This really speaks to Anthony. He's very interested in pursuing God. So what he does is he takes that literally. He sells most, if not all, of his stuff, and he goes and wanders out into the Egyptian desert to become a monk. So the term monk comes from the Greek monikos, it means lonely. Um, and this is a pretty good way of describing early Christian monasticism. So the early traditions, starting in the first century CE, typically what we think of in the study of early Christianity as the uh, apostolic age, the age of the apostles, is a rise of asceticism, so living by yourself away from society, basically being a hermit, and self-denial. So you are denying yourself, uh, it depends based on the time period. Towards the end of late antiquity, there's a general self-denial of monks and saints in the West of stuff like beef. Uh, sometimes it's vegetable matter, sometimes it's broth that was cooked with beef. So there's a deprivation of food element to it. Some monks specifically deprive themselves of intercourse. Uh, some deprive themselves of human interaction, stuff like that. So the whole idea is that by engaging in a life of asceticism and self-denial, you're becoming more holy, your discipline is becoming focused, it's becoming much more sharp, and it's allowing you to contemplate truth, enlightenment, and the overall nature of God. So these people, t 
typically retreated to lakes, swamps, nasty places where other people wouldn't go. Places where it's very, very easy uh, for you to deny yourself any and all things. And oftentimes, part of that self-denial and self-discipline came in the form of pain. So there are numerous caves in Egypt, for example, specifically in the south of Egypt, where early Christian monks would cut their palms open with knives, smear their blood in the shape of a cross, and then in front of it, while still bleeding, kneel naked on top of sharp rocks and pray. Because of their pain, it was believed, focused their discipline and their general being towards God. Pain made them sharp. Self-denial made them sharp. So this, this whole general idea is what these people are engaging in. So Anthony does something a little different. He doesn't go to a cave or a swamp or a lake or anything. He goes out into the uh, Nitrian Desert, which is west of the city of Alexandria. And in this policy of self-denial, Anthony is engaging in multiple days of fasting. Sometimes it's one meal a day. Extreme social isolation to the point where there appear to have been instances when people thought he was actually dead because he had not had contact with anyone for a while. So this basically is what this guy is doing. Eventually, though, what happens is there are other people who are interested in doing this. And it basically forces Anthony to go and deal with other people because they start viewing him as a holy person, somebody who is uh, enlightened and somebody who is an effective teacher because this guy's been doing this for years. Well, so he must know how to engage in all of this. So eventually Anthony starts getting followers who go out into the desert and they join him. But he's got a problem. Now he's got all these random freaking people and he doesn't really know what to do with them. So to better organize them, to better focus not only their uh, physical efforts in terms of construction, in terms of, you know, spiritual efforts, etc., he creates a system of structures to basically govern these people. So the result is that we have the rise of desert monasteries. These isolated areas where people go to become monks, to be away from society at large, and engage in the overall contemplation of the nature of God. Eventually, the concept of monasteries begins to spread. We have three different kinds of Christian monasticism, which we'll talk about in later videos, especially when we get to the medieval Roman Empire and the rise of Islam. Uh, but for right now, the thing I want to focus on is that monasteries spread across Syria. They spread across North Africa. And the life of St. Anthony, his hagiography, goes to what is today basically southern France, northern Italy, and it inspires a new area for Christian monasticism to basically start. So the most important follower that Anthony has is this guy named St. Marcarius. What I'm about to tell you, um, I'm not entirely certain of the veracity of it. I know of this story from one specific 12th century source. I don't know of any earlier examples. But even if it's not true, certainly it speaks to the self-discipline of monks and what they wanted to achieve. So, so the story goes, Marcarius felt a mosquito bite him. So he smashed the mosquito, like any normal person would do. But he feels so bad about this, about killing this tiny little mosquito that all the thing wanted was some of his blood to survive, much in the way that occasionally he would enable himself to have a little bit of food to survive. He feels so bad about this, he apparently strips naked and goes into a swamp for months, letting the mosquitoes just feast on him as a way of, you know, doing penance for taking the life of another creature. So I don't necessarily know if that's actually true. <laughs> if it's not, certainly it, it reflects how monks believe they should behave in this time period. Now on top of this, on top of monks going out to live in the desert, we have other forms of self-denial. So Simeon is probably the most famous example of this, uh, but there are a group of people called stylites. These are guys that lived atop of like 20, 30, 40, 50 foot pillars because they believe that, well, being on top of this pillar does a number of things for me. One, I'm closer to heaven. I'm closer to reaching God. I'm away from society. I can't get food, so I'm dependent basically on begging, etc. Uh, like I mentioned in the beginning of the video, there were some ascetics that went to caves. They prayed on rocks because the pain reminds them that they're immortal. Some of them painted crosses in their own blood on the cave walls. 
etc. Uh, there is also one story, though, that speaks to how these people begin to be understood by the Roman population. So in about 350, some Roman soldiers go into a town in Syria to go collect taxes, like they're supposed to do. This is a group of heavily armed soldiers. They have spears, they have swords, shields, helmets, armor, etc. These are people you ordinarily would not want to mess with. But the road is blocked by five guys wearing this rough spun, really itchy um, wool tunics. It's not comfortable to be in. It's re they're really hot. They're sweating. They have clubs, so pieces of wood compared to a soldier's spear. And they have crosses carved into their forehead. Some of the wounds are still fresh. Some of them have scabbed over in the healing a little bit. Five, five monks block the road. And these soldiers run away. They're terrified. Why would a group of soldiers be terrified of these five dudes who live out in the desert? Who are now blocking the road? And the answer, basically, is that they're understanding these people to have a certain level of power. So, like we talked about in the previous video, in the ancient world, the overall mentality of people towards the existence of gods and deities was markedly different than uh, the modern mentality, than the modern mindset. In the modern day, unless you are an extremely religious person, usually the modern person does not really conceive of gods and other forms of deities as having like a legitimate concrete presence in the world. In the ancient world, this was different. In the ancient world, this stuff is very much real. People looked at ancient forests, for example, and very much understood that within that ancient forest, there was a forest deity. People looked at rivers and felt the same things about river deities, so the list goes on. Um, in Greco-Roman religion, this stuff is organized in a pecking order. Towards the lower levels of the, I guess, spiritual ranking of, of gods and deities uh, are demons. So demons are a Greco-Roman form of spirit. These are not necessarily benevolent. They are not necessarily malevolent either. To an extent, they kind of just are. But the monks who are out in the desert genuinely believed that these demons were, how, how do I want to put this? They were, I guess, well, they were, to the Christians, what we now understand to be demons. <laughs> they were uh, deities who came from hell. They were malevolent spirits. So a lot of the uh, literature, a lot of the primary sources in early writings we have of the Desert Fathers, the Desert Mothers, so these early Christian monks who were out in the Egyptian desert, reads like, you know, a wrestling match. Like, oftentimes you'll find in these primary sources language along the lines of the holy warriors, the monks stamped in the dirt and cast the demon out of the ring. They were using Greco-Roman wrestling language to understand, to convey that these monks literally believed they were holy warriors because they believed they were out in the desert actually fighting demons, actually fighting malevolent spirits. Uh, who would tempt them in their quest to better understand God, and in due course, the monks would win. So, in these actions, among other actions, which we'll talk about as we keep going through this series, Jesus Christ is often viewed as not necessarily like a war or a, a martial deity, someone who is strictly associated with war, but he's certainly looked at as having characteristics of a warrior, and his actions in the temple in Jerusalem are proof of this. So if you're not familiar with this story, Jesus basically walks into the temple in Jerusalem and all around it and inside of it, to a degree, he sees merchants all around the temple area selling stuff. This is a building that's supposed to be sacred to God. So you don't do this in the temple. So what does he do? He doesn't ask these people to leave. He flips tables, he throws things, he breaks stuff. He uses force to drive out merchants from the temple of God in Jerusalem. So, in that light, 
Christianity looks at monks as using force to drive out demons. So, in the long run, what this is going to do is, in the medieval period, when bishops and other monks go on the battlefield, they bring God with them. So, God is present on the field in a manner that Romans would not necessarily have been overly familiar with until the advent of Christianity. So, this is how this impacts the overall development and the function of medieval warfare, which is why we're covering this. So in the next video, we'll keep going a little bit with this topic, and then we'll move on. So until then, I will see you all next time.